Mnuchin. Steve Mnuchin uh, used to run a, a bank that once foreclosed on a woman because she was a few cents late on her mortgage, uh, short, short on her mortgage. So Steve Mnuchin, not exactly the warmest character in the Trump administration slash regime. Steve Mnuchin now saying that he's going to talk with lawmakers uh, about some disclosure, perhaps, about the $512 billion, with a B, dollars, um, which only $130 billion only, uh, is still left to be spent because the money that they've given out thus far, he has been unwilling to say, uh, Jason, how much, uh, who that went to. It's probably in the president's bank account. It's a secret, apparently, um, because he is not willing to tell who got that money? That's your money, by the way, uh, taxpayers. You're welcome. Um, and now he says, well, you know what? Maybe he'll have a conversation because it got out that he's unwilling to disclose to lawmakers who got that money. Um, and we're assuming it's big, big, big businesses. There have been a lot of organizations like Crew who've been digging in to find out who got them. We did find out that about $20 million of that money went to uh, luxury um, small aircraft carrier. So the luxury plane people got some of the money. We know cruise ships got a bunch of the money. A bunch of travel-related mm -hmm, big businesses. I wonder who's in the travel business that we know of in America. Oh, Donald Trump is. We know that in Scotland, uh, Donald Trump got a million dollars at least in relief money from that government because he has these Scottish golf courses that actually have been losing money, um, never gave what they promised in terms of the money that they were supposed to dole out to the local community. People have thrown shoes at, at the um, and done protests at these Scottish golf courses because they, they suck. Like, they're not actually making money. They've never made the money that they, they promised. So we know that Donald Trump is raking in emoluments from overseas. We know that he's been doing that. He's been having foreign um, leaders stay at his hotels, which every time they swipe their card, that is an emolument. It's going right in his and his kids' pockets. He's never hidden it. The thing about what Donald Trump does is he does it in plain sight. Like he does it in the open. He he the the, the kind of raking in money. It's very Putinesque, right? You get the sense that when you do business in Russia, a part of the money that you spend goes into Vladimir Putin's pocket. That, that, is, that is what it seems, that's what seems to be happening, right? That he is a kleptocrat. We now have an administration that feels very kleptocratic as well, as well as kakistocratic. It's a kakistocracy, meaning the worst of the worst people running your government. That's all kakistocracy means. It's a word that a lot of people have learned through the existence of Donald Trump and his Trump regime. But now we have the Treasury Secretary admitting that he considers it to be private, non-public information who your tax dollars went to in a bailout that was for the coronavirus. Didn't they have a watchdog or some kind of oversight Supposedly, in the beginning? Well, so it's called the, Congress. Uh, <laughs> Congress yeah. is the watchdog. I, and we had Chuck Schumer, we had Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer on AM Joy, and we asked him directly, are you going to make sure that Trump, that our Democrats going to make sure that Donald Trump does not get any of that money? You need to ask them again. We need to ask them again because it appears that some unknown people, unknown businesses are getting this money. And I find it very hard to believe that none of those unknown businesses don't have the word Trump in the name. This was a paycheck protection program that was supposed to go to small businesses, people like Melba's, our friend Melba, people like Chocolat in, um, in Harlem, <clears throat> people that are small businesses who were hurting because they were losing all their business. You can't have your restaurant open, and so you need money because you still got to pay your rent. People who have, you know, important, like small businesses that are important to the community, that are part of the community. Instead, a whole lot of this money has gone to unnamed people and Mnuchin won't say who they are. And he says that the information is confidential and he cites privacy concerns. How can it be confidential who your tax money goes to? That's the hypocrisy of the whole thing. 500 billion. You know that's, oh, that's half a trillion, right? <laughs> that's a little more than half a trillion dollars. That's a lot of coin. As of Friday, the, the, uh, this, this plan, this Paycheck Protection Program, has supported 4.5 million loans for a total loan value of $512 billion, with roughly $130 billion still to be spent. That is the, the emergency money that was passed by Congress, Democrats and Republicans, in order to save America's economy. But it's the fact that some of that money is secret. A lot of what we talk about with Donald Trump is the things that he does in the open that don't seem to comport with democracy. Um, in a democracy, everything that your government does, because they are your employees. The president is a $472,000 a year employee of the American people. He works for you. The idea that he could have his treasury secretary, who he appoints, give out money, your money, 
in secret to potentially mega corporations and billionaires and not tell you who they are and you don't have a right to know privacy concerns baby you don't have privacy when you're taking my money you don't have privacy when you're taking the taxpayers money you don't get privacy um it's really strange it's really strange and the fact is we don't know whether minority businesses, female owned businesses, um, you know, LGBTQ owned businesses are being discriminated against. We have no way of knowing because Steve Mnuchin says he ain't gonna tell you who got that money. We'll find out after they get out of office. What we need is a giant audit of everything about the Trump regime. We know again that he's taken in emoluments because he's he's still running his hotels and his resorts, and he keeps trying to get business into them. Doral Golf Course, which was also losing money before Donald Trump became president, most of his businesses were losing money. He then says that Mexicans are rapists and lost even more money because a lot of contracts went bye bye. Did they didn't want anything to do with him? He lost Jose Andres, who is the, the, you know, legendary and actually almost saintly uh, chef who was supposed to have a restaurant inside of the Trump Hotel in D.C. was like, bye bye. He's Mexican-American. He's like, adios, we're not doing this with you. And so he lost these two businesses. You have other hotels, Marriott's, et cetera, suing Donald Trump over emoluments saying he's has an unfair advantage because when foreign governments come and they stay in DC they they stay in Trump's hotel because they want to curry favor with him and again every time they swipe their cards they're paying him they're paying his kids they're they're still making money while he is president you're not supposed to do that but of course the way our our system is designed these are these are these are not laws these are uh, checks and balances. Exactly. Well, they're not laws because they were, they're put in the Constitution, but they're basically suggestions. Well, you have to check before you balance it. <laughs> exactly. They're norms. And so no one's checking. And so it ain't balanced because nobody is forcing the Trump administration to follow the law. And a lot of these things are suggestions in the Constitution, not laws. Because, and I've said this before, um, you know, I've said it on the show, I've said it on, on what to read. A lot of what the people who set up the United States did, because they themselves were patricians who were subjects of the King of England. They put things in the Constitution to protect themselves from being subject to the King. But they had no interest in putting in things to prevent themselves from behaving as the King. I'll say that again. They put things into the Constitution to prevent themselves, who were patrician English citizens, British citizens, English citizens. They wanted to make sure they were no longer subject to the king, to his taxes, to his laws, to the ability of the Red Coat Army to station in their homes. They wanted their own castle doctrine to be respected. They put in things to prevent themselves from being subject, but they put nothing really in the constitution to prevent them from subjecting other people from making other people their subjects so their wives and their daughters couldn't vote so enslaved people were three-fifths of a person they could be enslaved and that was fine you could discriminate on the basis of race you could discriminate against uh, indigenous americans you could take their land they left a whole lot in the constitution that allowed them to act as the king that they themselves could act in the guise of George III. So it's like they didn't really oppose the thing George III was doing. They opposed what George III was doing to them. And so they themselves built a constitution with a whole lot of Swiss cheese size holes in it that Donald Trump is now exploiting. And when early on, the first president to try to exploit the holes in the constitution was Andrew Johnson. He tried to exploit the hell out of it because he was like, I'll fire whoever I want. You pass a law in Congress that says I can't fire the secretary of war, whose job it was to protect the enslaved, the, the newly freed slaves in the South. The secretary of war was putting troops into the South to protect the formerly enslaved from their former quote unquote owners, their so-called self-claimed owners who wanted to kill them and drag them back onto the plantation if they wouldn't work for free for another 400 years. He fired that guy, Andrew Johnson. And the radical Republicans, who I've said before, radical Republican used to mean super duper anti-slavery Republicans, said, nah, you can't do that. You can't fire him. You're impeached. And so the first president who tried to 
to defy these, you know, to try to exploit these Swiss cheese sized holes in the American Constitution was Andrew Johnson. Others did try as well. Richard Nixon was the next most egregious one who tried to exploit it. Andrew Jackson tried to exploit it. So there have been people who pushed and pushed and pushed at the limits that the Constitution well, placed on the presidency. They plugging up some holes now because Trump has busted right through them. He's bust. He took the Swiss cheese and shredded it. Mm -hmm. It's now shredded Swiss cheese. Donald Trump has blasted through the holes that were in the Constitution. Nixon tried real hard. He tried to turn the government into his own personal, um, you know, fiefdom where he could use it to go after your taxes if he didn't like you, put you on an enemy's list and use the government to attack you. Nixon tried this too, but he got impeached. Trump tried it too, and he got impeached, right? The third one who really tried to go through and shred the Constitution's limits on the presidency was the third one is Trump. He got impeached. Clinton doesn't count because all Clinton did was have an affair, <laughs> and, and they didn't like him because he was a Democrat. Clinton didn't actually do it. I mean, the thing he did, which, you know, they impeached him for, was that he lied about the affair. And so they used that to say, well, you know, you're a perjurer. You should be impeached. So there was a very thin read on which to hang the impeachment of, of Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton had a lot of issues. You know, I was not happy with a lot of his treatment uh, of black people, including the crime bill. But Clinton didn't do anything to, as egregious as what these other people did. I'm sorry, you can argue with me on that, but I, I don't agree with it. But anyway, the fourth impeached president is Trump. But here's the problem with Trump. Unlike the other three impeached presidents, he has a unanimous, unshakable hold. No shame. And, and, and shame-free mm -hmm. following among elected Republicans. Forget the actual Republicans. Even Nixon had the, had a hold on, on, on voting Republicans to almost the very end. But he didn't have a hold on elected Republicans. Because normally the way that these framers of the Constitution assumed, what they assumed would happen is that every man has an ego. They never thought women would be in power. Every man has an ego. And so each member of the United States Senate and each member of the House would have his own sense of of almost monarchical power, and that each man's ego would act against the ego of the president. And so these, these members of the Congress, especially the Senate, which are the high brow, the upper chamber, would never let the president overtake their own power, that they would guard jealously their own power, and that that thing is the checks and balances that keeps a president from becoming a king. You couldn't have a king because there'd never be a court. There would always be other men who also craved power and who would fight against the president overtaking their power. For the first time in American history, in 275 years of us being a republic, you now have a party in the same party as the who is the same party as the president who are allowing their power to be overtaken. They have no ego. They seem to have no shame and they seem to have no sense of uh, duty. They seem to have no embarrassment. They actually don't seem to have any pride. You think about a Ted Cruz who you, if somebody said that, called me a name and said I was ugly, I would expect Jason to say something. You're going to be scrapping. You got, I mean, the idea that, 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 that he was, that he let his wife be humiliated by Trump. That is, that is the behavior of a subject toward a king. Let's just say it again. The way that subjects used to behave, the court, the king's court. You think about the Joffrey Baratheon, uh, if you want, if you're a Game of Thrones person. How do the people in his court behave toward him with sycophancy? They don't operate with their own sense of power. They operate all based on the king's power, and they never react to it. That's the way that... England expected the United States to behave, that they would always act as a court, as courtesans, and not as people with their own mini kingdoms. Ted Cruz operates as if he is a courtier of Donald Trump. Marco Rubio, courtier. Uh, Lindsey Graham, courtier. Um, you know, all of them act as if they are subservient to Donald Trump. That's not normal. That is not the way that the system was built. So Donald Trump has shredded everything, including turning his party into courtiers. They don't have, uh, Rand Paul acts all macho and tough that he's going to do this and do that with his tough man beard. He's a courtier. None of these people lifts a finger to stop Donald Trump from shredding their power. They're willing to be subordinate to him, to lay down on the ground on their bellies and crawl around on their bellies for him. That's unusual. So today, to go. so what, what, right, because the thing is what you want in, in a republic that's built the way ours is built, what you want is to have the other, you know, seats of government, the House and the Senate, to guard their own power, to each have egos the size of the president's ego, because that actually is the only thing that prevents us from, from becoming a monarchy. 
is that there are no courtiers. Each one a kingdom. Every man a king. That's what it means. In addition to meaning, I also think I can subject and subjugate black and brown people and native people. And that is all the negative part of it is built in too. The part of it that's protective of us is that they, they, they fight the king's power. They won't let him be a king. Baby, these Republicans are willing to let Trump be a king. I guarantee you if Joe Biden becomes president, though, they're going to find oh, their senses, find and then they'll be like, uh-uh. Oh, they, they mm-hmm. will recover all uh, of a sudden. Real quick. Real all quick. of a sudden. Now, it, it all depends. Now, would the Democrats let them get away with it? Of now, if they, they let them get, So, therefore, of why not continue doing it? The reality is, is Democrats don't operate that way. They need to. They don't operate that way. And so, yes, I think uh, Jason is absolutely right. The instant a Democrat is president again, Suddenly, the Lindsey Grahams, the Rand the Pauls, yes, the, they will wake up like they just snapped out of a coma and suddenly say, wait a minute, we have power and we're going to use every inch of that power against the president. All of a sudden, these same weak, supine, obedient Republicans will suddenly decide that, they, that, there's, a, that there's a spine inside of them and that they have to fight the power that they used to call President Obama. They used to say he wanted to act, he acted like a king because he did Obamacare. <laughs> they said acting like a king was giving you health care. Acting like a king was letting DACA kids stay because they'd been in the country the, since they were two. He, they said that was monarchical behavior and they had to fight every minute of it for the Constitution. You know, remember Ted Cruz used to be so full of, a, you know, pissing vinegar. You know, and I'm, I'm outraged giving the, the knaves health care. How dare you give them health care? How dare you let those little immigrant children stay? We have power too. <laughs> and now the Trump is like, well, you know, maybe we just really do what he says. I mean, maybe we, maybe we just be to let him do it. I mean, if he needs to make money on his hotels, I mean, he got hotels. <laughs> They all of a sudden, like, you know, you know, maybe we should just be noodles because, I mean, noodles are, there's some water already boiling and it does Both need to have a noodle in it. Out of office, man. The, uh, if the, <laughs> the Republican Party and those friends that, we, Jason and I both have friends that are Republicans, uh, the mutual friends that are Republicans, they get it. The, the ones who walked away from Trump, the people who formed the Lincoln Republicans and all that, they get it. They understand, at least for now. <laughs> They're on the same side as the Democrats. That you can't have a, a, a president this powerful because if you give any man this much power, this one individual in government this much power, he will abuse it and he will use it to steal and he will use it to destroy and dismantle the United States. We have on a guest today that this is her thing. This is the thing she writes about, the thing she talks about, the thing that she is about is when does an American presidency become a regime? How does it become a regime? And can we extricate ourselves from this regime behavior? This is going to be a fun interview. Let us bring her in. So I'm excited to introduce someone who I, I, I you have to verify this for me that I don't think we've ever met in person, but I feel like I've gotten to know her and she's become a, a, a friend through cyberspace. This is the weirdness of the modern world that I doubt we've ever actually met. Uh, Sarah Kenzior, New York Times bestselling author of another fabulous book. We could really do two What to Reads here because The View from Flyover Country, rarely, uh, sort of a rarely seen um, look at the way that the Midwestern world, and I grew up in the sort of Midwest West, and so it, it you know, it, it rings true to me. Um, so she wrote about that, and not many women have written about that, Sarah Kenzior, but her new new book is Hiding in Plain Sight, The Invention of Donald Trump and the Erosion of America. Sarah, hello. Hi, thanks for having me on. Of course. So let's verify. Have we ever actually met in person? No, I don't think so. Right. It's been a uh, TV cyber relationship. So. Exactly. And so this is the weird thing about the modern world. I have so many friends that I've made uh, on literally through Twitter that I've never actually met. But we are friends because we're fighting on the same side for the same things. And the way I got to know you, Sarah, is that other people on Twitter were tweeting at me saying, you need to have Sarah Kenzior on AM Joy. Why aren't you having Sarah Kenzior berating me? Like berating me. How have you not had Sarah Kenzior on? Because we were talking about Trump. My friend Malcolm Nance, who I actually have met in person, um, Malcolm, we started having Malcolm on, and I am proud to say we were the first to really have him on. We And we started having him on weekly during the uh, Republican uh, campaign, and he and uh, and um, uh, Naveed Jamali became our weekly guests, and we were getting berated, saying you've got to add Sarah. So we added you, <laughs> and we've never let you go, Sarah Kenzior. Um, 
talk a little bit about your background. How did you come to be an expert in basically bad regimes? <laughs> Yeah, well, I have a PhD in anthropology uh, from Washington University in St. Louis. And as I was uh, studying for that, I mostly focused on dictatorships in former Soviet Central Asia, especially kleptocracies uh, like Uzbekistan, where the executive abuses his power uh, to enhance his personal wealth, installs members of his family in administrations or um, otherwise, you know, siphons money to them, uh, you know, denigrates the press, uh, oppresses, you know, his people. Similar situation in Azerbaijan and Russia. And so when Trump emerged, um, you know, in 2015 as a leading presidential candidate, I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is going to be the American version of an autocrat. And then as that uh, campaign progressed, I realized this was not a metaphorical connection at all, that he was selecting people like Paul Manafort uh, that worked for oligarchs connected to the Kremlin. He had had his own decades of Kremlin ties, including ties uh, to the Russian mafia and all of this is pretty much being ignored by the media uh, who are treating him as a joke or a form of entertainment with the notable exception um, of your show and of the work of Malcolm and a few other people it, it is it is interesting because I you know and I'm glad to, to, to give people because we never have time we have like usually seven minutes on TV so we never really have time to dig into this because I don't think people know your background people really know you as somebody they heard on Twitter saying hey hello this guy is an autocrat in the making and I feel like uh, that your background because you studied foreign regimes helped you to see him clearly just as I feel like my family background of having had a parent two parents that came from autocratic sort of countries, particularly my father, that I'm like, whoa, this is Mobutuism. Like to me, it was like I could see in him what you see in a lot of African dictators. And for you, what you could see in him was, like you said, Azerbaijan and what you saw in Russia. And, and as you said, the American media was very resistant to this. They didn't want to see him this way. Do you feel like now the media has caught up with you and that they suddenly are, are seeing what he is or is there still resistance in your view? I think there's still resistance. I mean, finally, people are using words like authoritarianism and fascism. I think two weeks ago, uh, where he was bringing out the military to yes. potentially fire on protesters, that was kind of a breaking point. But I've watched the media go back and forth on acknowledging the severity of the crisis. Um, you know, American exceptionalism, I think, was was a blinding force. I think that's something that that maybe you and I did not share in part because we've seen this abroad. Yeah. Uh, we've also seen America's own tradition. Um, of autocratic state sanctioned practices yeah. but there's also just been um, too much faith in, in institutions mm -hmm. that we have a system of checks and balances we have a constitution and that somehow these things just work by themselves and you don't need to actually have people uh, you know in there that are willing to carry them out uh, have effective oversight people didn't realize how easy it is yeah. uh, to just gouge this whole system to purge agencies pack courts and how blatant um, they'll be about it. I think in a way that works to their advantage. They commit their crimes, you know, as I say in the book, they're hiding in plain sight. They're yeah. doing it very openly. And I think that because it's so open, uh, plenty of people were reluctant to take it seriously. They thought, oh, like he can't have possibly just confessed to obstruction of justice, for example. You know, there yeah. must be something more to it. It's like, no, it's really that simple. Uh, he's a flagrant criminal. So are his lackeys. They don't worry about being caught as long as they're not going to be punished. And so far, they really haven't been. Is there something about the American system? Because I think the theory of the case of the United States is that it was built to withstand and to prevent autocracy, that this is the ultimate freedom. This was the escape from the king, right? It's literally the escape. They escaped from a kingdom, the King George III, and set up a republic with the idea that it was resistant to ever falling back into a kingdom. Is there something about the way this country was put together that makes us especially susceptible to autocracy? I don't think we're necessarily especially susceptible because I think this can happen anywhere. Uh, this can happen to any country if, if you're not vigilant. And I think, you know, our founders said that we need eternal vigilance uh, in order to thwart this. I think some of the things that weren't anticipated was an entire political party going along with the autocrat, uh, propping, propping him up, not doing um, their job. But I think also there's been a reluctance to look at our own history uh, with clear eyes, you know, at Native American genocide 
genocide, at slavery, at Jim Crow, at internment camps. Those are all uh, state sanctioned autocratic practices that were practiced selectively. You yeah. know, they were racist policies aimed at certain parts of the American population. And there's been a lot of, oh, that was just the times or, you know, we need to, to kind of look past that or that's done now. I mean, none of that ever went away. And that ability to abuse power legally, you know, yeah. none of those acts uh, were illegal. They were immoral. They were horrific, but they were legal by the government until they were declared illegal, until law actually was changed. And I think we're kind of at that point now where we have a lot of crime, this sort of, um, you know, merging of white collar crime, organized crime and state corruption that's on the line uh, between legal and illegal. Someone like Manafort um, kind of sums up that activity. And we don't have the institutions, um, you know, equipped to deal with that. In many ways, they've been infiltrated. In other ways, they're just uh, ineffective. You know, and, 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 and yes, and I, and I have to also say that the other thing, and this is the sort of painful revelation for those of us who are in the business, is that the media doesn't seem to be set up to resist, right? Because there is this compulsion to normalize. I mean, I talked about it in my book as well, that it, there's a compulsion to fit him into normal. I'm gonna read a little bit from your book, and this is Hiding in Plain Sight, and this is your chapter on um, where you talk about s some of what the media did when Trump's 2016 campaign began to pick up steam, uh, making uh, this person worry that he may become the candidate. A person named Hurt asked his publisher, uh, Norton, to reissue Lost Tycoon, but they told him the 33-year-old book was now too dangerous to publish. I'm gonna skip ahead here. Um, it says that tr reporters who had covered Trump's early criminal history were silenced. A Claimed journalist David K. Johnson, who we all know from uh, from MSNBC as well, another AM Joy friend, um, author of multiple bestsellers about Trump, noted that in addition to refusing to cover the rape, the the alleged, I should say, rape of Ivana, the 2016 press would not report on Trump's documented ties to organized crime. The, to me, this is one of the biggest mistakes that, as you said, Trump was covered as entertainment in 2016, but there were some egregious allegations, including in from his former wife, Ivana, but also on organized crime connections. And it just didn't penetrate. Yeah, and one of the things that's amazing is that these crimes were very well documented. They were documented in real time in the 1980s and 1990s by journalists like David K. Johnson, or in particular, um, Wayne Barrett, who died uh, the day before Trump was inaugurated, you know, and he reemerged a bit in, in 20. 16 to try to warn everyone. Uh, Tony Schwartz, Trump's ghostwriter, warned people as well. And so this was all there. Um, the court documents were there. The documents connecting Trump to Jeffrey Epstein, for example, and uh, you know his alleged rape um, of a 13-year-old girl, they were all out there. Those stories uh, were buried, and it took a coordinated effort. Um, you know, there were so many journalists of that era just trying to get the stories out. Um, when I sometimes would tweet out just those old stories, I'd have people accusing me of fabricating them. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I would tweet Trump's own interviews, you know, with his own words and his own voice, and I'd be accused of having somehow uh, imitated him as well. They, it, they did not either want to see uh, the horror that was in front of them, um, the kind of documented extreme criminality and corruption, or they were being, you know, maybe uh, coerced not to publicize it. We know that Trump's lawyer goon squad, you know, dating back from Roy Cohn, but certainly going up to Michael Cohen, they threaten reporters, they bribe them, they blackmail them, they threaten networks. Um, you know, Ronan Farrow detailed this uh, quite a bit in Catch and Kill. Yeah. I think a lot of those tactics were used uh, fairly successfully in 2016. And on top of that, there is just this kind of sense that it can't really be this bad. Because if mm -hmm. it was this bad, like the FBI would do something or the Obama administration or the rest of the Republicans or whatever institution you pick, like they would be acting as if our national security was in jeopardy. They'd be acting as if a criminal were about to take the presidency, and that would be a huge deal. They didn't really act like that. Uh, and I think that that contributed to the reluctance of the media to just call out what was going on because they were so afraid of being um, alarmist that they didn't sound the alarm. Yeah, or of seeming partisan. There is this this, this mm -hmm. sort of mania about seeming down the middle, and I think it, it helps Republicans because they are much more reluctant to criticize Republicans because they are perceived as liberal and they don't want to be perceived that way. But you, you, when you write about everything in this book from receiving death threats, um, you know, and a lot of us got very threatening social media interactions, Nazi or fake Nazi or, you know, little frog that were a Nazi, you know, in, just inundated with it. 
when, when you get this coming, that is not a normal reaction to a presidential election in the United States, right? This is the first time I've ever seen anything like that. Um, that didn't seem to really alarm people that much. It, 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 do you think it's partly because Donald Trump is a part of the New York media? I mean, you're not in New York, which helps you, right? That you, you're, mm-hmm. you're separated from it. But do you think because he's a part of New York media, it kind of lulled New York into a sense of kind of passivity? I think that that's true. I think that they expected a certain kind of behavior uh, from him. I think he's also been a source for them. And he's in this very rarefied, insular social circle. You know, one of the things that that cracked me up in a kind of horrible way about the New York media is they were like, oh, you know, Donald Trump poured down trodden Donald Trump from Queens always wanted to be part of Manhattan and it's such a little sob story and that's why he's so angry and I'm sorry like when you live in the rest of the country uh, and you hear that the you know born millionaire from Queens feels sad because he's not a billionaire in Manhattan I mean, you're basically <laughs> looking at a bunch of like really rich people and their petty grievances and, and it's not going to spur sympathy um, in anyone so their whole sort of way of evaluating things is really weird it's really skewed there's a lot of nepotism in media especially yeah. in new york media and i think that that helped um you know put in this kind of contrived framing you also see a lot of overlap between um politicians and people who served in government and the media itself and you know it's it's the swamp it's the very swamp that yeah. trump said he was going to drain yeah. he's in it he embodies uh that swamp and so do all his cronies you know yeah. people like roger stone especially so yeah um they either missed it or they chose to miss it. Either way, you know, the, who loses out in this is the American public. Uh, you know, we're not just deprived of government, we're under attack by our own government. And that's not a partisan thing. Uh, yeah. You know, you can look at so many issues where, where Republicans or conservatives are uh, affected in a negative way, just like everybody else. So I really see this, um, and it's always seen this as a nonpartisan threat on the American people, one that's bolstered uh, by the Republican Party and by people like Mitch McConnell um, to an enormous degree. But that hurts everybody in the end. Uh, in, indeed. I mean, you, I mean, Jared Kushner owned The Observer. He was a part of the media. I mean, the Trump family are, as you said, very much enmeshed in the media. I think that really hurt, you know, the ability to see him clearly. Let, let's talk about uh, sort of where we are now. And, you you know, and, and I, I love how you write because you write very honestly and very forthrightly about this. It, it is sort of a re- it's regime behaviors that I've started to use that term a lot. Um, but now we're in a, a phase of the Trump era where it feels like some of the regime pieces are crumbling off. You have a global pandemic that clearly Trump has no idea what to do about. So it's it's getting bad. I mean, over 105,000, I think, as we're doing this today, probably 112,000 or more Americans have died. More than 2 million people have contracted COVID. 40 million Americans have lost their job as of the time that we're recording this. Um, you have people in the streets all over the country, really all over the world, reacting to the murder of George Floyd uh, and police brutality and human rights violations, essentially, by the United States uh, police. I mean, it's getting bad. Um, do you do you see crumbling regime behavior in even what you see Republicans doing? They seem to be like, hey, can we get this five hundred billion dollars and give it to our friends like right now and not have anybody know? It feels like everyone's cleaning out the the palace and taking all the silver. Is that just me seeing that, or or do you see that see it that way too? Oh, no, that's their goal. That's what they've wanted to do the whole time. I think the first time I was ever on your show back in 2016, I said they wanted to strip this country down and sell it for parts. And that's what they've been doing. And that's what they're doing now. And that's what someone like Steve Mnuchin, that's why he was inserted uh, to run the Treasury. And they're hijacking a pandemic. They're taking advantage of an incredible tragedy, which is what Trump has always done, whether it's uh, financial crashes, 9-11, whatever it is, he only sees it as to how does this benefit him Kushner is the same way, Um, you know, Mnuchin, Wilbur Ross, all these guys who worked in in Wall Street finance, they they view the world this way. I do think we're seeing something unique um, with the protests. I think that, you know, what's happened to some degree is that white America uh, has realized that it too is disposable under Trump. I don't think that, um, you know, people who are black or Latino or immigrants or in any of the the other groups that the Trump administration has brutally targeted, they already knew that the administration saw them that way. I think with coronavirus and the fact that they did not uh, supply adequate medical support, that they in fact conducted mafia style shakedowns on governors to deprive people of that, that Trump doesn't care, you know, if all the 
always, if, you know, 100,000 Americans have died, he won't even lower the flag. It's dawning on them. No one is coming to save us. They don't care if we die. We're just, you know, human capital stock, I, I think one of oh, yeah. them called us. And so, of course, um, you know, that will prompt people to finally uh, take to the streets, you know, on, on, on top of, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter cause. And I, I do think these protests are, are significant. They're worldwide. Um, they're not just against police brutality and racism, but also against imperialism, colonialism. There's a lot of reassessment of our history um, as Americans and of these, you know, original sins. And, you know, how do we have a just society? How do we have a fair society? I think people are asking those questions and realizing how uh, rotted our yeah. institutions are from the inside. And, you know, now we get to the tough part, which is, OK, you know, we've had a uh, transnational crime syndicate essentially hijack our government. They don't care about the public welfare. We've lost a lot of our leverage. And I am worried about that, especially with voting rights. Um, you know, it's not so easy as just vote them out. How will we move from here? How will we rebuild? Um, and I think that that's that's an unpredictable thing. It's very easy to predict what an autocrat will do. And Trump has followed the dictator's playbook. It's a lot harder uh, to predict how the people will react and how they will react to a public that is, you know, very obviously fed up um, and is fed up during a, uh, a historical pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it's listen, it took 42 years to get rid of, uh, of Hosni Mubarak and his very similar syndicate. Uh, it took forever to get rid of Mobutu. It, it's, it, they still haven't gotten rid of Putin. It is very hard mm -hmm. to work your way out of this kind of system, even when you think you replaced it in places like Iraq, when the U.S. went in and knocked off the Saddam Hussein regime. It's not like they got a better government. That's, what's, that's mm -hmm. what I guess frightens me, um, Sarah, is that I haven't seen it go well, even when you get out of it. Poland got out of it, and now they're they're heading right back toward, a, you know, a sort of fascistic style government. Italy got out of fascism, and now they're creeping back toward it. Is is do you see just you looking at it from a scholarly standpoint? How do you get? How does America get out of this? Yeah, that's a great question, because from a scholarly standpoint, I could see a million different terrible ways that this could go, whether yeah. full fascism or the breakup of the United States oh, into by separate the way, regions. Can I, just say, or, I don't mean to interrupt you, but this sister called her, her epilogue End Times Road Trip. Okay. Yeah, so basically, not, I. I <laughs> I didn't realize how that was going to uh, read after the pandemic, but I mean, good God, that's like the, the fact that that's, <laughs> it's right there. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. And it's about the nostalgia for the time where you could just drive around a United States freely uh, showing your children uh, historical sites and so forth. Yeah. I mean, that, that part, I wrote that part with a lot of emotion because, you know, I'm thinking of my children, I'm thinking of everyone's children yeah. and the future of the next generation, which is in jeopardy, but for it to come out when it did, um, you know, in April at the height then uh, of the pandemic was something. But yeah, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it, there has been peaceful, uh, you know, resolution or dissolving of, uh, you know, autocratic regimes, you know, the 1989 revolutions in Eastern Europe, um, the fall of the Soviet Union, which was messy, but it could have been a lot worse, uh, the end of apartheid um, in South Africa. But, you know, as you said, we've had this direction worldwide towards uh, hard right, um, you know, proto-fascist or fascist uh, administrations in, in Turkey and Hungary, in uh, Poland, in countries that had seemed to be moving in a democratic direction before. For the United States, um, it's a really mixed bag because we are, you know, a continuous constitutional democracy for a long time, but we've always only been that on paper. You know, yeah. we were never fully that in practice. So everything that we've ever done wrong, uh, every every flaw, every atrocity that was never remedied is coming back uh, full force. And then we have people in charge of the government who have no intention of uh, bettering it, of strengthening it, of making it honorable and a fairly weak opposition um, in terms of both the Democratic Party and the court system and all these other institutions that could potentially stop it. Um, you know, I'm hoping that people recognize recognize that, you know, while we've we've never been a, a perfect democracy, we have gone very much downhill in four years and we need to make moves uh, to remedy it. And that's absolutely impossible with Trump and his crime family um, in office. You know, they will they will bar any pro 
progress uh, that we seek to make as citizens. The, things will get worse over time. Uh, we're already seeing attacks on freedom of assembly. I think that that will continue to free speech, free media. And these are all things that as Americans, um, we've tended to take them for granted, which is not the same for uh, Poland or Turkey, for example. They could remember times when, when media was uh, much more censored. They've watched this back and forth. We're going down a road that I think a lot of folks, even to this day, still think, well, that can't quite happen right. here or that won't really happen to us. And unfortunately, um, I think it can. And I, I hope that because so many seem to recognize this uh, much more now, that they'll fight very hard um, you know, for the freedoms that we do have left to preserve them and to get back the ones that we've lost. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm glad that you, you, you laid that out. You laid that out so, so well, because what I tend to say to people is anything that can happen in any other country can happen here. This high, the mm -hmm. idea of American exceptionalism probably has been the most dangerous thing to the average American that's ever been floated because it's given Americans a false sense of security that, oh, well, that can't happen here. No, anything, including apartheid, which happened here before, including, you know, regimes taking over that don't leave, anything that can happen because we're just people like every other person. So the idea mm -hmm. that those things can't happen here is ridiculous. Any of it can happen. Um, what, what is the worst case scenario if Trump gets reelected or finds a way to stay in office uh, after uh, no, January of 2021, in your mind? Oh, gosh. I mean, <laughs> the, the worst case scenario is basically you know, an existential threat to human existence. And I, I know that sounds over the top, but I'm thinking of things like uh, the climate crisis. Yeah. I'm also thinking of Trump's long held desire to launch nuclear weapons, um, you know, which he's wanted to do or professed wanting to do since the mid 1980s. He's still obsessed with it. He actually has the capacity to do that. Uh, there have been some moves to try to prevent him from having that capacity because you don't want someone who's enthusiastic about that to be the president, ideally. Yeah. Um, I, I worry that, you know, if he feels like his regime is collapsing, if he feels like he's losing his money, his power, his immunity from prosecution, that as he goes down, he will take down not just America, but he'll try to take down the world with him. Uh, you know, he's sadistic. He's destructive. There are different types of autocrats. You know, some are really bureaucrats who have just uh, subsumed all power under their control. Yeah. There are others who are just, um, they're, they're in it for the pleasure of pain, of distilling pain upon others. And unfortunately, Trump is that type of uh, autocrat, and that's what makes him exceptionally dangerous. So that would be my number one worst case scenario. And I think my second one would be, um, you know, the United States splitting apart into different countries, possibly warring countries, um, you know, and, and all of the, the chaos and destruction and looting um, that that would bring about. And I mean, like Steve Mnuchin style looting, not like I stole yeah. TV from Target kind of so <laughs> yeah no I it, and, and I think part of the reason and again I listen you can tell me anything that's the worst case scenario and say that does, that people think that sounds absurd not to me it doesn't because again any of these yeah. things can happen that's Americans need to wake up that any of this stuff could happen and we are already two countries we're two countries that don't even like each other if you think about red and blue America we are very different as 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 just fundamentally you know, that in, in red America, there's just a different attitude toward government, toward other people, toward multiculturalism. It's just very different. We're just two different countries. So if we can stick together, then, you know, then, you know, Lincoln may have had it right. Um, if Donald Trump, let's say, were to lose the election, let's go there. Because there's a lot of talk um, that I've now heard people openly, um, even Joe Biden talking about, it. let's say he loses He's got all these armed friends out there, fans who are super fans, who are sycophants of his. What do you are you worried about what election night looks like if Donald Trump, whether he wins or loses? Oh, yeah. I've been worried about that from the moment that he, you know, was installed in, in 2016, because once an autocrat gets in, it's very hard to get them out. And it's in his own best interest to declare this election illegitimate, no matter what happens, in order for him uh, and his family to stay in power, because he wants to hold on to his money, he wants the, his political power, and he wants immunity from prosecution. Because right now, uh, he uses his position as president to prevent any kind of law enforcement 
enforcement body um, from investigating the crimes he committed while in office, as well as the decades of uh, criminal or at least illicit activity that he committed before getting into office. And that also includes the activity of Ivanka and Don Jr. and Jared Kushner, um, you know, the latter of whom especially should be looked at much more closely. So I think he's going to say it's rigged. He's going to encourage violence um, from the very hardcore part of his base. I don't think most of his voters will turn to violence, but you don't need a lot of people um, yeah. to cause a lot of problems. And, you know, he's blatant about this. Like he, when he talks about the Second Amendment, uh, you know, that's what he's getting at. And we've had people from his inner circle, like Michael Cohen, when he testified, say, like, yeah, of course, Trump's not going to leave. Of course, he's going to try to stay there forever. And I think the ultimate goal is for them to try to install Ivanka as a successor and then just keep that money uh, rolling through a dynastic kleptocracy and keep that power uh, held by a very small amount of people. Uh, it's tyranny of the minority. You know, just to comment briefly on what you said before about red and blue America, you know, I live in, in Missouri, um, which is allegedly red, and I live in St. Louis, which is allegedly blue. And I think that these designations aren't as um, cut and dry. You know, they're not as hardly hard defined um, as the media often makes them out to be. You know, I think we're all purple. Like I said in my first book, where America is purple like a bruise. Um, but what we do have, though, are governments uh, that, you know, state governments that uh, rule in very different ways. If you're under Republican rule, like I am in Missouri, uh, it's a very different set of circumstances than in a place like New York. Uh, and we're also denied our rights through things like gerrymandering, voter suppression, striking down uh, ballot initiatives that citizens, including Republicans, wanted. They just don't care. They don't care about the public will. And seeing that on a, a micro level, uh, it has been frightening to me uh, because I now see it on a, a macro level, on a federal level with the Trump administration, but also just with people like um, Mitch McConnell in the Senate. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. I'm glad you made that point because, right, if you actually go to like, you know, Lexington, Kentucky and just talk to regular people, even if they seem like they would be red people, they're like, no, we would actually would love to have our education funded. They just can't. Yeah. Get it. Yeah. No, it's a very good point. Most people do want their kids to have a good education and to have health care. Most people want that. It's just you're sort of I don't know. It's a, it's the way that people are governed. Um, hmm. Yeah. No, it's a good. I'm glad that, that you made that point. So we're, we're heading into an election now where there does seem to be a fair amount of public resistance to this mess. Um, if you could advise Joe Biden, let's say Joe Biden becomes president, the next president. In, as you look at, re, at, at this sort of regime behavior in other countries around the world, what is more effective at preventing a resurgence of it? Um, pardoning, like what um, what uh, Gerald Ford did with Richard Nixon, and saying let's, or, or what uh, Abraham Lincoln tried to do before he, you know, decided to pick the wrong vice president and then go to the theater, which was one of the biggest mistakes in American history. So he gets a lot of credit, but I think that should make him not the number one president in history because you picked the wrong guy and then went to the theater. Uh, but you know, trying to have this sort of let's let's come together, which seems to be Joe Biden's mindset. Or prosecuting them. Because, you know, George W. Bush, a lot of, you know, torture, horrible things were done under George W. Bush. But when, when the Democrats took over Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi said immediately be, upon becoming Speaker, impeachment is off the table. Right? And so this idea of reconciliation with the other side, or just prosecuting folk, is that more effective? Should, should people be thinking about prosecuting some of these people in the Trump um, administration? I think they have to prosecute them or they're just going to do this again and again. You know, what we see with the Trump administration is a literal continuation of the worst administrations and worst crimes that we've had. Like you can go all the way back to Watergate, where you have Watergate protégés of Nixon, like Roger Stone, uh, you know, working with the Trump campaign to Iran-Contra, um, where you have Bill Barr, the Iran-Contra cleanup guy, as well as, you know, a number of people involved in that crime um, to the 9-11 aftermath. Uh, you see people uh, from that era, you see war criminals like John Bolton to the 2008 financial collapse in which, uh, you know, Wall Street looters were never profitable. Yep. 
prosecuted. And, you know, in every single one of these cases, it has made life worse uh, for ordinary people. And again, it doesn't matter what party you're in. You suffered economically, politically. Uh, you suffered in terms of just having respect for your government, uh, having a government of integrity because nothing was prosecuted, because they always would do this, oh, we need to just shake hands and move along. What it's done is create an impression of a sequestered elite that is immune from legal consequences. You yeah. know, they have elite criminal impunity. Uh, that's how I see it. And that's one of the few times that I think people who, uh, some of the people who voted for Trump see it the same way. They may blame uh, different politicians uh, for enabling this system, although occasionally there's overlap, but we all see it. And that's not a government that serves the people. And so I think that Joe Biden needs to say, you know, that the time for elite criminal impunity is over. You know, we are public servants. We are going to serve you. And then, um, you know, go on to discuss how that's going to happen. And I think focusing on corruption and how if you clear out uh, corruption from government and corruption from corporations, how it benefits people uh, financially, it benefits them in terms of their, their freedoms and their rights. That's a very appealing message. And that is a message that brings everyone together, but not in a kind of superficial way uh, where we're just going to you know look the other way and let everyone keep on criming, like in a meaningful way where we're really thinking about what it means to be an American, to represent Americans, um, you know, to live in a democracy. We need to be very honest about all the things that have gone wrong and who's responsible and name names and, uh, you know, bring them to trial and hopefully to justice. Yeah, I have to tell you, I you know, I think I thought um, Barack Obama was a, a, a wonderful president. And I look, I worked for his campaign in 08, so I obviously believed in him. I think his biggest mistake upon entering office was that he didn't frog march a whole bunch of Wall Street um, criminals uh, and, and prosecute them. I think if he had done prosecutions first and then moved on to, you know, the, the saving the economy and doing health care, I think he would have been in a great position politically. I think it would have been good for the country to see that there's accountability at the top. And the thing that's so confounding about America is that it's a country that's built on the idea that you can come up from nothing and become something, except that once you become something and you become rich, you become impenetrable by the law. There almost is no accountability to the law of rich people. By the way, you mentioned John Bolton. I can tell you who's not going to be invited on what to read. John Bolton is not invited <laughs> because, glad. you know, you should have said what you had to say by testifying mm -hmm. in front of the Senate. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mustache, you're not invited to the what to read party. I'm so sorry. Uh, but, yeah, do, do you think, I mean, it does feel like that is the only remedy, right? That the, the people need to see that American elites are accountable to the law because it doesn't really feel like that right now. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely not. They're, they've been on a crime spree since I was born. Like the people in the Trump administration, people like Trump, Manafort, Stone, uh, you know, Bill Barr, Jeffrey Epstein, like they've been on a crime spree since I was a child uh, in the 80s and no one ever held them accountable. And now I have to live with the consequences of that. My children have to live with it. You know, all generations have to live with it. it it's a real thing. It's not about revenge. It's not about partisanship. It's about making sure that incredibly destructive people do not have access to incredible amounts of power. And that means that, yes, they have to be held accountable uh, by the law. They can't just, you know, get little tiny uh, sentences or, or pats on the back and, you know, promises that they're not going to do it again. Like, uh, you know, quite obviously um, that doesn't work. And yes, I do think Obama should have clamped down on that. I mean, look at how uh, Bernie Madoff is remembered. Everybody is very glad that he was prosecuted. He's yep. one of the few examples of justice being served. If that had been the case for others, you know, I, I think uh, Obama would have been looked at very favorably. And yeah, of course it would have been tough in real time, but you know, in, in the eyes of history and just in terms of the consequences of that, had he done that, yeah. um, you know, I think it would have been very beneficial Absolutely. for American society. I mean, I mean, they prosecuted what, what, what the lady who makes the sheets Martha what's her name Martha Stewart Martha Stewart it's like the, you know when you finally decide to hold the elite accountable it's the blanket lady it's like that's, yeah that is not enough uh, you write in your book that the, the about this idea of we're still searching for the smoking gun to say you know what maybe this is an autocracy and you said the gun is smoking because he's shooting our country to death it's smoking because no one will take away the gun it's smoking because the very people tasked with protecting you reload it for him again and again they'll keep firing until all constraints are removed and there is no one left to gaze at the carnage and ask why nothing uh, is being done. Um, it, it, it's not, listen, this is not a beach read, but y'all need to read this book. <laughs> it's called Hiding in Plain Sight. I have to ask you before I let you go, Sarah, what do you read? What, what, what is in your, what is on your bookshelf? 
Oh, gosh. I mean, I read all kinds of stuff. I just got um, Connie Schultz's novel. I haven't started yet. yet. Um, I got what? the she book has a novel? about. <laughs> Wait. Yeah, yeah. She has a new novel. Okay, so she I'm, can I'm come to What's a Rage. She can come. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got the book that Harry Reid recommended about UFOs because he's been giving all these weird interviews and that, you know, is just sort of like a fringe interest. And so I, I want to see what the hell that is. I mean, this is the era we live in where, yes. like, we could have the Pentagon be like, hey, guys, you know, there's UFOs now. And we all get so bogged down in the day-to-day horrors of the pandemic, Great Depression, and fascism yeah. that we've, we've forgotten about the UFOs. So I'm going to see what the <laughs> hell he was talking you, about. See, this and is so why, that's, see, that's people, on my bookshelf right now. This is why you should not reject friends that from the you and i share a lot in common one of which is i am also obsessed with ufos i've been obsessed with them since i was Have a kid on joined we need to bring this to the masses Have Man, to talk about the to UFOs. Talk about that, that way that way everyone who called us hysterical crazy people i'm sure they'll be reassured that, that we're just completely <laughs> fine and have fine. normal interests in back life. in the day people used to be like well that you and sarah kenzie or y'all y'all are way out there y'all are really <laughs> crazy y'all say some stuff that can't be true and now that we're like yeah we were right you should have listened to us in the first place exactly also UFOs. <laughs> okay it is illogical that we're the only thing in the universe that has sentience it doesn't make sense i i love this exactly. topic we got to do this on on tv we, we do I, I would be happy to <laughs> and one day one day another person who uh eventually we have to actually be in the same place at the same time having many 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 cocktails this has to happen it has to happen before the apocalypse because the apocalypse is coming. <laughs> well, you better do it soon. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Kidzior, I, I, I adore you. You are amazing. The book is called Hiding in Plain Sight. The cover, the cover is, I don't know who did this artwork, but ooh, <laughs> it's the it's Lady Liberty like sinking, <laughs> sinking in a yeah, red pretty sea. Much. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing book. Uh, it has tons and tons of really great blurbs on the back because people understand how brilliant you are. I am so glad Twitter brought you to me, Sarah, and all the people who berated me saying, you better have Sarah Kizzy on. <laughs> okay, you were right. <laughs> Fine. Oh, man. <laughs> right, well, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Have a great day. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> All right, I want to thank Sarah Kenzior uh, for being on What to Read. She, she is so great. She's one of those people who you, you don't get a chance to talk to her as long as I would always love to talk to her. I always wish I had more time with her uh, when she's on AM Joy. It was really fun getting a chance to get to know her just a little bit more. Uh, Hiding in Plain Sight, this is the book. Uh, it's a very important book. I think people need to read it. They need to listen to her. And I love that she put that PhD out there, honey. She's like, she's not just talking off the top of her head. She knows what she's talking about. She knows about. what she's talking about. She's a trained, she's trained in the subject. So you need to listen to what she's saying, uh, whether she's on TV or whether she's here on what to read we love that uh, and getting to know her just a little bit more she's a lot of fun and she's into the ufos like i am i myself am which i think is very important i love it thank you harry reed for the book recommendation nerd i wrote Central. it down we a couple of nerds but it's okay i'm proud to be a nerd uh, so we appreciate it hey listen give us some comments throw some comments uh, down below you can also share 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 this uh, wonderful episode of what to read hit that little alarm button thing if you hit the little alarm button on the youtubes you can make sure that you never miss another episode of what to read because We've got so many great guests coming. Great conversations are all coming up about books and the books writers. Uh, and, of course, we want to holler at everybody who's listening on Spotify, on Apple iTunes, if you guys are just listening and not Lipsing. seeing um, everything. And if you're on Lipson, hello, Lipson people. Um, so we appreciate all of the support. You guys come back for more What to Read. And uh, I think that does it for us. Does it for me also. All right. Beam me up, Scotty. Bye, fam.